Hi, and welcome to my second video on physical anthropology. Um, the first video was really introductory, and in this video I'd like to talk a little more about the discipline of anthropology and explain a little more specifically about what physical anthropology is and how we're going to study it in this course. So, um, what is anthropology? Of course, taking the word apart is always helpful. Um, the study of human beings, the study of, of human beings is, is really the definition of anthropology. Uh, anthro from the Greek meaning human, and ology means the study of. So fairly straightforward there. Um, anthropology is a very, very interesting field, finds itself within the social sciences, uh, along with things like sociology, history, political science, philosophy, um, these sorts of uh, social science disciplines. So why is it a problem to have a field in which um, the subject matter is the study of human beings? Um, we have a lot of fields like that, as I mentioned, history, political science, philosophy, all of them attempt to answer questions about the human condition. But anthropology can sort of be thought of as an umbrella discipline that asks the question, what are humans? What, how do humans behave? Um, and so anthropologists use information uh, from several different uh, humanities, social science fields. Um, but there is a problem with having a discipline of anthropology, and, and it comes uh, from how do you really study using rational scientific methods yourself. Um, the idea of logical and analytical reasoning being applied to the human condition really uh, is a recent invention uh, in Western history, dating back to the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries. And so we take for granted that um, a rational, logical investigation using factual information, drawing conclusions, um, an empirical methodology is the way in which we learn about the world. And so if you, if you accept that fact, then logically it makes sense to examine the human condition uh, in this way. The problem, of course, is that we are human, so bias is naturally going to creep in. Now, as a social scientist myself, um, bias isn't a problem. Bias is something that we cannot escape. And so lying about it or pretending it doesn't exist is, is not the solution. So when we're studying human beings, we do need to be aware of our bias. We do need to be aware that we tend to believe that human beings are special. And, and that may be the first problem, is that we somehow believe that we have a special place in this universe, that we may be uh, the only intelligent life form on the planet, we may be the only intelligent life form in the universe, and uh, we're going to examine ourselves. Well, uh, right off the bat, you run into a big philosophical problem. Um, but uh, anthropologists are aware of this, and uh, in general, they do try to acknowledge it in everything that they do. So as we're moving forward with this, we should always remember that um, when we have this desire to see ourselves as something special, as this very intelligent creature that is capable of rational thought and that no other being is like us, that we're, we're falling down this, this, we're going down this path of, of human ego that's going to make it difficult to objectively understand our, our nature uh, and what it is that we do. So I just want to get that out of the way right off the bat is, is that um, as a social science field, anthropology is especially fraught with um, problems of bias at its very core. Um, you know, Shakespeare said uh, in apprehension, how like a God when describing mankind, in form and movement, how like an angel. And, and if we think of ourselves in that way, which we do, uh, it, it's going to be difficult to be objective and, and look at us, um, you know, in any other way than as, as perfect. You know, if we even look at our fiction, if we look at our science fiction, which I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, um, every science fiction movie ever, creates a universe in which almost all of the aliens, except for the weird episodes, are human. I mean, they're essentially human. They're blue skin, green skin, 
purple skin, they have an extra arm, an extra leg, an extra two arms, uh, you know, maybe has some antenna on their heads or strange scales. But they're ultimately humanoid. And, you know, just even that idea that, that alien life is going to just be a reflection of us, intelligent life must look human, that shows the, the deep-seated bias that we have, um, that we are in some way the perfect form. The idea that um, in, in Western philosophy that uh, human beings were created in the image of God, uh, again, problematic when we're studying uh, our nature and trying to fit ourselves into the larger scope of, of life and, and, and all that stuff. So again, an, an issue right there when we study anthropology. Move on to something a little bit lighter. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the branches of anthropology. Anthropology has a number of disciplines within it. Um, this particular series is going to be examining physical or also called biological anthropology. And biological anthropology attempts to um, answer the question about human evolution. How did human beings evolve into our present current form? How did we become human? Um, and, and what does our biology say about us? What, what information can we glean from our biology? So that's the, the field of physical or biological anthropology. Um, related, but often considered to be its own field by itself, is paleoarchaeology, which um, attempts to find answers to questions about human origins by digging into the dirt um, and actually pulling up bones of our ancestors. So, I mean, one can be a physical or biological anthropologist and not have any uh, relationship to the folks that do this sort of work in the picture here, digging into the ground. Uh, one can be a paleoarchaeologist and have really very little to do with anthropology as a field as well. So they are within physical anthropology anyway. So they are sort of separate fields in that sense. Um, the other big field of anthropology is cultural anthropology. And I think when you hear anthropology, this is generally what you think of is, um, and this is a classic image of the native tribesmen uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the person who's interested in finding out information about, about them. Of course, you can see the, the person interested in finding information is on the right and the native tribesmen is on the left. Oh, wait, no, it's the other way around. Um, cultural anthropology, uh, especially in the early 20th century, looked like Europe, white Europeans going into uh, native villages and examining these strange people. And that's true to an extent, um, but actually cultural anthropology um, attempts to answer fundamental questions like what is culture, how is culture used, and then attempts to, to catalog and explain different cultures in the world. And the person on the right in this picture is a member of a South American uh, rainforest tribe called the Yanomami, which are the most studied people in anthropology. Um, and the person on the left is, is an anthropologist from Europe somewhere. Um, I am going to submit to you that although most of you watching this video have very little in common with the person on the right, and you would consider yourself to probably be more closely um, related, biologically speaking, but also culturally speaking to the person on the left, um, both of the people in this picture are equally crazy in terms of the way they're dressed, in terms of the way they think about the world, the way they think about other people, um, both of them are quite mad. Um, and that's one of the interesting things about anthropology is that we learn that, that culture is um, really a set of, of instructions that we somewhat blindly follow. And um, I will tell you that I will, I will eventually do a cultural anthropology course here on YouTube when I get around to it. And um, cultural anthropology is one of the most interesting subjects that you can study. Um, it really does open your perspective. I live in China, and, and one of the, the fascinating things for me about living in another culture is to see um, the the silly ideas that people have here. And, oh, boy, these Chinese people are so crazy. And then recognize that I have my own form of, of cultural insanity, the of, you know, beliefs, magical beliefs that I hold um, that Chinese people find strange as well. Um, so we're all, we're all just a little crazy and, and that's really what cultural anthropology tells us. Um, related to cultural anthropology, I didn't put it on the slide, is linguistics. The, uh, language is the very, very basis of culture. It's one of the, one of the fundamental things that, that makes us human is that we have a very, very highly developed language. Um, both of the people in this picture have extremely highly developed complex languages. And, um, 
linguistics, the study of languages, is definitely a field of anthropology. Um, the last field of anthropology is applied anthropology. As I mentioned, I live here in China, and, and my last job was managing a team of foreign teachers. And um, a big piece of that job was anthropological, was using what I knew about anthropology, what I know about other cultures, to um, help my Chinese company, the, the Chinese members of my company, understand how different Western culture is and how they need to adapt the way they treat their employees who are foreigners. Um, and at the same time, talk to my um, mostly American staff about how to deal with the very, very different culture of China that they were living in and, and where that middle ground could be. And I really had to do a lot of um, cultural explaining to both sides. And that would be an example of applied anthropology. Um, if a large company is going to go into business in a new country, they would be well served by hiring an anthropologist, at least as a consultant, who is familiar with that culture to explain some of the intricacies of doing business in that country from a cultural standpoint. So applied anthropology could also be um, using what we've learned about physical anthropology, for example, to design the ideal office or to the ideal living space, right? What we understand about human beings. Um, you know, when we start talking about the controversy of people being on their cell phones all the time, that's an anthropological question. And, and understanding human biology um, and psychology, which again is of course related to anthropology, um, is, is very important as well. So those are the branches of anthropology. We'll be looking again in this course specifically at physical, biological, and, and some paleoarchaeology as well. So here I have a couple of pictures, and, and um, I like to think of these as the tools that you're going to learn to use in this course. Now, I think I said in my last video, I could explain human origins and evolution in a two-hour YouTube video or a two-hour documentary, and it's been done to, to death, and you can find those right here on YouTube. Feel free to watch them. When I watch them, I, I wind up yelling at the screen a lot because they oversimplify, they choose specific um, arguments or ideas, and stress those over uh, equally valid, potentially, ways of looking at things. And so what I, what I want to do in this course is what I did in the high school course that I taught, which was give you the tools necessary to make up your own mind. And as this field is constantly changing, as I pointed out in the last video, um, I, I want you to be able to understand the methods that are used to explore human origin. And then um, as new information comes to light, you, you can read those articles and learn more and, and have your unique perspective and really understand them better. So what do I have here? On the, on the left, I have um, a skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis. Um, this is the famous Lucy skeleton. Um, you know, the, the, the dark brown parts, by the way, are the parts we don't actually have of her skeleton. Um, the, the light parts are the actual parts of her skeleton that we actually have. Um, so um, part of this is the question of, of these long dead millions of years, and Lucy's, you know, over three million years old, um, ancestors. And how can we learn about them? And that's that field of paleoarchaeology. So we're going to look at these bones. What do these bones tell us about how this creature lived? How can you know? How, how can you take a small piece of bone uh, that's been buried in the earth and actually has ceased in, in almost every way to actually be bone and is now rock with a little bit of calcium material in it? How can you take that little shred of bone and learn something about the animal? How do you even know what animal it came from? And so um, rather than have you blindly accept that you can, I want to explain to you how archaeology works and how you actually can look at that fragment of bone and tell something about it. Um, in the lower right-hand corner is a chimpanzee. Um, primatology is one of the big uh, tools that physical anthropologists use to, to understand human nature and our biology. Um, the, we did not evolve from chimps. Um, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, we didn't evolve from a chimp. Look at this dirty ape. You are a dirty ape, um, and so am I. But um, we didn't descend from, we are not an ancestor of the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee, as best we can tell, has been around for at least 750,000 years. 
perhaps longer um, in its present form. Um, it is a cousin. We have a common ancestor. Um, but there are several species of apes that are very similar to us. There's the chimpanzee, um, its younger, its smaller cousin, the bonobo, younger cousin, its smaller cousin, the bonobo, or pygmy chimpanzee, um, the gorilla, and of course the orangutan are the other members of our uh, sort of clad, our group of great apes. Um, what do these apes tell us about who we are? Um, what can we learn about chimps? And, and you know, chimps are, are not, not as smart as us. Um, they're certainly probably as emotional, if not more emotional than we are. Um, they form long bonds. They, they love their children. Um, you know, they love sex. What, when we look at a chimpanzee, when we look at a gorilla and we study its behavior, what does that tell us about the behavior of Australopithecus on the left and potentially about ourselves? Because Australopithecus and a chimpanzee seem to have quite a bit in common. So um, we can use the primates and understand the primates, our closest cousins, um, to better understand ourselves. Now, to understand the primates and to understand how evolution works, we have to also understand natural selection, which is our third tool. So we're going to be studying Darwinian natural selection, the idea of evolution. Um, there are people today in the 21st century uh, living amongst us um, who don't believe evolution is a real thing, that believe that uh, the Earth was created in seven days, um, or if the Earth is not created in seven days, then God created us in his own image. Um, that's ridiculous. Uh, when I used to teach this class, I had to sort of pussyfoot around that a little bit, be careful with what I said. Um, you know, so I wouldn't offend anybody and get a, an angry parent phone call and have a meeting. Uh, but here on YouTube, I can say whatever I want. So if you don't quote unquote believe in evolution, that's fine. You're dumb. Um, evolution is far from perfect as far as an under, a way of understanding how things work. And we are far, far, far from understanding exactly how genetics works. But we do know that um, creatures evolve uh, and that we evolved. Um, and we do know that the mechanism by which this happens is natural selection. Um, and we can see it in action. We can test it. Um, and it has been proven as, as uh, the means by which new species come about. Um, and so we, you need to understand exactly how evolution works. You might have an idea, survival of the fittest. What the hell does that mean? We're going to explore that. So with these three tools, the tools of, of understanding evolution, archaeology, primatology, um, you will then be able to look at the evidence for how we evolved and make some decisions about it. So here we are, uh, the tools we need. And again, these are tools that I'm, I want to give you before we begin looking at human origins. Um, we'll probably start with, we're going to start with evolution. We'll probably move on to primatology and then finish with archaeology. But um, understanding this material is going to be your key. Uh, to really understanding physical anthropology. So let's talk about the big picture. And I, I, I'm, I'm reticent to commit to anything um, about human origins because there's so much we don't know, really. Uh, so here's what we do know. And again, notice there's a lot of wiggle room in almost all of these statements. Um, in the distant past, a long, long time ago, uh, right here on Earth, somewhere between four to six million years ago, a group of apes in Africa began standing up and walking on two legs. I don't even say a species because I don't know that that's true. Um, by four million years, there were fully bipedal, obligatory bipeds walking around Africa, meaning apes that had to stand on two legs to be comfortable. Um, it may be as far back as six million years or even earlier than that, that that change first started to happen. Uh, so that's that's the the big picture of human evolution. This is the less than two hour, but but longer than two minute explanation of human uh, or biological anthropology. Um, so those species of apes began to rapidly evolve large brains and regularly use tools. Perhaps more than one species did this. Um, and again, tough to tell. But uh, some of them began to use stone tools to butcher meat. Um, maybe because of the stone tools or the stone tools are evidence for this huge rise in brain size and intelligence. 
Um, when that happened, we don't really know. Um, it looks like it's earlier and earlier than we thought. Um, at some point, one or more of those species that were tool users left Africa and very, very quickly in terms of, of um, in, in terms of the history of the species spread throughout the rest of the world within uh, um, a few thousand years uh, spread throughout most of the rest of the world, uh, maybe not North and South America, although that date of, of human habitation in North and South America keeps being pushed back as well. Um, but yeah, one or more of those species left Africa. It's, it's looking more and more like more than one species left Africa and then spread everywhere on the planet, uh, including Arctic regions pretty quickly. So um, again, the big picture of human evolution. And by around 200,000 years ago, it appears that um, one species of bipedal apes had become what we can all agree was human. Um, there's controversy over exactly when that happened. Um, there's controversy about how many other bipedal intelligent hunting species lived on the planet 200,000 years ago. Um, it's fair to say there were at least two, but now it would in the last uh, five or six years, they found another species, uh, a third species that seems to have ranged far over Asia. Um, so yeah, eventually a being that um, everyone can agree we call that would be human existed on the planet. And so that's the story of human evolution. And there's tons of tons of gaps in there, which is the cool part of anthropology. This does not mean an alien species came to this planet and genetically manipulated some apes and turned them into humans. If you believe that, you should just stick with science fiction because there's no facts to back up what you're saying. There's just some weird stuff that you could then make your own narrative out of. And that's not what this is going to be about. We're going to stick with facts. We're going to have conjecture only so far as that conjecture um, is based upon factual information that we've, that we've discovered um, and, and reason. So what? So who cares about that story? Um, so these are big questions. How, when did we evolve and, uh, and why did we evolve in the way we did um, are very, very important to understanding who we are. It, it, it is the fundamental question, what makes a human a human? And part of this, this discipline is actually defining what a human is and what a human isn't. Um, I will use the term human actually very broadly. <clears throat> Some anthropologists would only refer to a human as something that evolved maybe <clears throat> 100,000 years ago, excuse me. Um, I will go back 500,000 to even almost a million years and, um, and say that humanity begins somewhere there. Um, but that's a question. What makes a human a human? Um, what does our evolutionary process tell us about ourselves? Um, what should we know about ourselves that, uh, that maybe would be helpful on a personal but also on a species level? You know, you see a picture of people eating, uh, eating and drinking coffee in Rome. I see a bunch of apes wearing clothes in a communal activity, <laughs> you know, of some kind of strange communal activity. Um, you know, if you looked at a picture of, if you look at this picture, uh, it seems very natural to us. If you saw a bunch of chimpanzees sitting by a river eating nuts, you would think that's a very different thing. But in fact, it's pretty much the same thing. Except the odd thing in this picture is most of these, these apes don't really know each other. They're, they're in very small groups, and, and they'll probably never see each other again. If they were chimps, they would all be a, a large extended troop. So, you know, again, what does our physicality, what does our evolution tell us about our behavior? Um, is this important for understanding our destiny, where we're headed and where we should be headed? Um, that's a good question as well, and a deep, heady thought. Um, and, you know, just ultimately, what does our biology tell us about ourselves? What, what, um, what can we glean from it? Everything from questions of marriage um, to questions of child raising to questions of eating correctly. You know, you have all these people running around doing a, a paleo diet, which is based on uh, essentially false suppositions about how early ancestors uh, might have eaten. Um, so, you know, again... This is a physical anthropology question. Physical anthropologists hear paleo diet and they, they kind of laugh because that's not how people were eating. <laughs> you know, we domesticated 
crops somewhere around 12,000 years ago. So like if you want to eat paleo, it would look very different than the way people are eating paleo today. Okay. Why should you study physical anthropology? Um, I think you should study it, and, and here's a couple reasons. You're gonna one, you're gonna learn about evolution, and, and that's important in a world today where people are actively walking around and not believing in evolution. Again, I put that in air quotes. You can't see me, but I'm putting it in air quotes. Um, evolution isn't something you believe in. We we don't believe in things like that. We believe in uh, things that we can't see and can't understand. Um, Darwinian evolution, we can see, we can test. It works. It's real. Um, so you'll actually learn how it functions, which I think is helpful. Um, the idea of archaeology and how we can learn about the past, what bones and stone tools tell us and what they don't tell us. One of the interesting things about archaeology is how much it leaves blank and understanding what the bones, what the things in the earth do tell us and what they don't tell us is important. Um, one of the things you will understand is that there are more unanswered questions than there are answers about our evolution. It's, it's not set. The story is not told. Um, it's still a developing story, and it probably always will be, and there will probably be questions we'll never actually be able to answer unless we can invent a time machine that we trust actually works <laughs> and isn't some sort of, like, fantasy uh, that we get into. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, we're never really going to know a lot of this. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we can make up stories about our evolution when we don't know it's okay not to know. and We don't have to fill that in with fanciful tales unless those fanciful tales are fiction and we understand them as sort of interesting and fun fiction. Um, I think especially now it's important uh, for people to gain an understanding about how we can know things. Uh, the very idea of, of the very theory of knowledge itself, uh, how you can purport to know something in an age of alternative facts, an age of um, people saying whatever they want to say with no repercussions and claiming that they have um, knowledge of something when they actually don't. Uh, that's the, the world that we're starting to live in. Um, as we have more and more access to information, we're starting to decide that, that we, can, we can say whatever we want. And because we said it and because we think it, that it's, that it's all equal. And, um, it's important to have an understanding about how we actually understand and know things. Okay. Some cool questions that we're going to address in physical anthropology that, again, once you have the tools in place, you'll be able to have um, a real opinion on. Um, what does make you an interesting species of ape? Are you even all that interesting? Uh, that question. You know, we, we seem to be interesting. If we look at the evidence around us, the cities we live in, the technology we've created, we seem to certainly be interesting. Um, we've spread all over the planet. We're, we're, we're extremely successful as a species. Um, maybe we're about to destroy ourselves. Maybe we're not. Um, why? Why? Um, Going back several million years, why did those apes first stand up and become bipeds? What drove that massive biological shift? And you're going to learn what a massive biological shift it was. Very impressive, very rapid, apparently, also. Um, so how did apes stand up and become bipeds, and why would they have done it? Because my back really hurts right now. If I wasn't a biped, my be so much easier on my back. Um, Proto-humans, meaning the things that weren't quite human yet, uh, even that term proto-human, oh, it implies a, a, a trajectory towards being human. But anyway, why did our ancestors lose their thick coat of hair? And why? When? We don't even know. Um, we used to think that it was recent, and it turns out there's some evidence to suggest it was a long time ago that naked apes were running around. Um, so, yeah, why did you keep it on your head as well? Oh, because the sun. No, nah, maybe just because it looks good and people like it. Um, I mentioned the stone tools in my last episode, my first, uh, my first lesson. Uh, how old are those tools? How are they made? Um, what do they do? We'll learn all about that. Um, can you buy one on, on YouTube? I mean, YouTube, wow. Can you buy one on eBay? Yes, you can. And you can buy it pretty cheap. Um, and it's probably real because we made a lot of stone tools, at least our ancestors did. Um, this is one one of my students studied in college, um, and I thought was very 
interesting that she studied it. Um, why do female humans hide their reproductive cycle from themselves and from their partners? Um, as far as I know, human females are the only mammal species uh, to do that. Uh, humans are the only species to hide their fertility cycle. Uh, most mammal species advertise their fertility cycle to every male of the species in uh, in you know mating distance, um, you know, purposefully to to show that they're fertile and they're ready to reproduce. Human females hide this from everyone. It's a mystery in and of itself. Um, what species did we evolve from? There's all these creatures that lived. Which is the missing link? There's no missing link, or there's a billion missing links. Where does it come from? Where did our, who is our ancestor in actuality? Um, the question of, of leaving Africa and colonizing the world, how that actually happened, when did it happen? Um, again, cool questions that we will address in this course. Um, and again, lastly, what I want you to get from this course, really, real quick, um, I'd like you to be able to think critically about information. I think that's something that everybody at any age should learn to do. Um, I want to give you the tools to understand a complex topic. Um, I don't want to just tell you what I think the answers are. I want you to look at, at the possible um, interpretations. Um, I would like everyone to understand that, that what we call sort of truth is constantly evolving, just like human beings and animals and, and everything. Um, and it's transient. And you should be ready when you encounter facts that disagree with what you thought the world was like, that you're ready to, to give up on the old interpretation and accept a new one. Um, it's a healthy way to be, sometimes painful. Um, and, you know, on a personal note, physical anthropology will teach you what you are biologically and give you some insights into, into your physicality that you may not have had before. And, and that's helpful. All right, so next time um, we will begin with our first real unit, our first tool. Evolution through natural selection. We're going to look at this finch, and we're going to learn all about how animals evolved um, or still evolve uh, into different forms and how that happens. Uh, so we'll cover in the next lesson basic heredity and population genetics. You've studied heredity in your biology classes in high school. You may not remember it. Maybe you studied it in college. Maybe you are a biologist, in which case you'll just be hammering me in the comments for all my inaccuracies. Um, but if you're like most people with a layman's understanding of heredity and genes, um, you don't know much about population genetics. So we're going to look at population genetics and basic heredity as well. So as always, thanks for joining me and I will get the next episode up as soon as I can. Thanks. Hey, so um, as you look at the next videos in the series, uh, I figure you can also look at some monkeys having fun. These guys uh, were up on Ame Shan Mountain in uh, Sichuan, uh, southern, well, central Sichuan. Anyway, um, if you'd like to subscribe to my channel, I'd really appreciate it. Right down there in the corner, you can see it popping up. Magic. Um, if you'd like to see the next video in this series, the upper uh, right-hand corner of your screen should have that right now. It's wonderful. Look at these, look at these crazy, crazy, crazy monkeys. Don't feed the monkeys. Don't do it. Anyway, um, if you'd like to see some videos about my uh, life in China, you can see that playlist on the upper left-hand corner there. And then uh, coming up in the lower left-hand corner, my... Um, my series on living and working in China, uh, for those of you interested. And with that, we'll uh, I'll let you out with some music and some more monkeys.